Jesus, we thank you that you are the one to rescue us and redeem us. Lord, you've delivered us from the bondage of sin and you've conveyed us right into the kingdom of your light. Lord, this morning we want to hear from your word. We want to apply it to our life. So Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our hearts to receive from you. Change us, Lord. That as we leave this place, we may go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And Lord, we may enjoy our relationship with you and be used effectively in the lives of others around us. Thanks, God, for never giving up. And we just present these things into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. And you're going to want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In 1958, they came out with a movie called The Blob. Any of you guys seen that? I think I might have saw it on Mystery Science Theater or something like that. But uh, here was this, this movie about this cosmic jello uh, hidden in a crater that came and crashed to the earth. And of course, a guy found it, and the moment he touched it, it consumed him. And so he was jellified. And people came and grabbed him, and they took him to the hospital, to the doctor, singing, watch it wiggle, see it jiggle. No, and, and they got him there, and the doctors, in checking him out, touched him, and they were consumed with it as well. And this blob, this, this mass of whatever it was, grew into the size of a mountain, and no one could stop this Thing. And so people tried to cut it and shoot it and stuff until someone decided, hey, I'm going to try to freeze the thing or I'm, I'm going to throw something cold at it and it kind of shrunk back. And they realized that this thing doesn't like the cold unless they went out on, so, so if they went out on a hot day, it would just consume you and blobify you. But so you, you stayed and you made this cold environment in order to contain and control this blob and and so eventually they, they froze it and they decided to take it and drop it by plane in Alaska because no one lives in Alaska, right? Um, this is 1958. But the, the point of it is, is that sin often is, is, is like that. It, it, it can get out of control. It can consume you. And if you give it the right environment, it'll continue to breed, so to speak, and take over more than you even thought. Like an incubator environment. And so we've got to look at the fact that this, that sin may remain in life, but it doesn't have to reign in life. In my life, I am still going to sin because I'm in this body of sin and I'm going to do stupid things because that's just how life is going to go. But it doesn't have to reign in my life and control and rule over my life. I have a choice now because of the work of Christ. And Paul has laid out for us here in the book of, of Romans, the first three chapters, he points out our guilt, right? Whether you're the heathen or the Hebrew, the pagan or the religious guy, you have failed God. No one is good in God's sight. We all have sinned at some way or some point or another, and we've missed his glory. So he points out our guilt. And then in chapters four and five, he shows us grace, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And grace came in and did this incredible thing called justification, just as if I'd never sinned. That's how God looks at me through the work of cross and the work of Christ, is just as if I had never sinned. It's an amazing thing. But now through chapter six through eight, Paul kind of switches over and his, his key here is what's our goal now? Because grace has saved us, what's our goal? The same grace that saved you, that bought you, now begins to teach you how to live what is called sanctification, which simply means set apart. I'm set apart to the Lord for holy standing before him and holy living unto him. And so that's what we see as we continue on in this next section. Sin's penalty is definitely paid for, but the power of sin is still present to rule over, and it depends on the choices you're going to make. The blob of sin sits at the door. Check out chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Because we know God's grace is there to forgive us, 
It does not give us the excuse to continue on in habitual sin as if God doesn't care because grace is going to take care of that. He says, certainly not, which means, basically it means perish the thought. It's, it's in such a negative, in, in no way entertain that thought. As he said to us in chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in sin, and now you are dead to sin because of the work of the cross. It's a choice that I make because I died to sin. There I crucified the old man, the sinful man there at the cross. I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I want to follow you. I want to be a new person in you. But we realize this, that the, 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 the flesh has a slow death, so to speak. The sinful tendencies are still there. They're following you on Twitter. They're friends to you on, on Facebook. They're shooting you texts every once in a while. And they're saying things like, hey, hey, you know what? It's okay. You've had a hard week. Go ahead. Do that. You know what? It, it, you need that. You really do. Who's really going to care? No one's going to know. And the sin is there to still entice you to go down these roads that you know the Lord would not be pleased with. It's the, the battle that is there. And we need to really allow the Holy Spirit to be the one to reign and rule in our life but how does Paul illustrate, illustrate this principle? He takes us back to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. You know, when someone gets saved, there is a tendency by some to say it's all about the no's, the N-O's. You need to stop doing this. You need to turn from that. You need to don't make sure this isn't happening in your life. But the reality is, and the reason why they do that is because they think that, well, if you just tell them God's grace has covered your sin and needs to leave your life, that they're going to somehow abuse this thing. But the reality is it's not about the N-O's, but the K-N-O-W. Now that you have been saved, know this. Know Jesus. Know God's grace that is huge. And know that that grace still does not give you an excuse to continue in sin, but it's a motivation for you to run from sin. Because God is so good, I want to run to him, not from him to cultivate this life and enjoy this fellowship. But we see here four things regarding our relationship with Christ that every believer needs to, to uh, consider. And the first one is to know the facts of your union and your communion and your identification with Jesus Christ. And that's what he gets at. In verse three, he says no. In verse six, he says it again, knowing this. In verse nine, knowing that Christ, he, God wants us to know him and to know our standing in him. And the fact is this, fact number one, if you're taking notes, you and I, I am inseparable from Jesus. Can you, can you grasp that? That as Paul writes in Romans chapter eight, there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation that stands against me. No charges will be made against me. No situation in life I go through or would face would ever separate me from the love of Christ, God is pleased to have you his forever. That's an amazing thing because there's times when we feel like, eh, this is not a good day. God want to kick me out? No. He sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. In verses six and seven, we then read that knowing this, that our old man, he's not talking about your dad, he's talking about your sinful flesh. Our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Fact number two is that I am not a slave to sin anymore. I am not a slave to sin anymore. Jesus was crucified, so was my old man, that nature that is inherited from Adam. It's not a renovation of the old man, it's a crucifixion of him. It's not turning over a new leaf. He's meant to be pinned to the cross and to die. I've changed masters from the bully of sin, senior sin, to the Savior who loves me. 
And he now has the rule and authority over my life. My body that is driven by sin, notice it is done away. It doesn't mean that it's, it's annihilated. The word literally means that it's rendered inoperative. It's paralyzed. It's pinned, so to speak. Oh, yeah, it's got a big mouth still. Amen. It's a bully when it comes to things. And there is a slow death taking place. But Jesus did something that I could never do myself and that is to kill, so to speak, kill sin and redeem me. And I am liberated by the cross. You hear people sometimes say, you know what, I just accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. How come I still struggle with sin? Because that, that tendency, those simple tendencies are still there. It's a slow death to the flesh. Don't listen to them. I'm not a slave anymore to sin. And I have found over the years of ministry that oftentimes we know this in head, but we have a hard time practicing it in life. Why do some Christians live a defeated Christian life? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I, I, I've seen it over and over. It's a pattern that is there. Number one, they forget. They forget what God has said. They forget what God has done. They forget what sin costs. They forget the things of the Lord and they begin to rely upon themselves. Sin has a numbing effect that makes us forget what God has said. And that's why God brings us back to the table and says, remember. That's why he says, be in the word daily so you can re be remembered and remind yourself of my plans. That's why he says, hey, come back to the cross and remember the cost for your sins that you have been redeemed. And let that be the motivation as you go forward. So oftentimes a defeated Christian walk, they're forgetting who God is and what he has done. Number two, they're failing to plan. You've heard that phrase, you know, if you fail to plan is a plan to fail type of thing. You see, somehow they think that, well, if I, if I just, I've said the prayer and everything's going to be nice and neat from here on out. No, no, no. God wants you to go forward in grace, but he needs you to heed his word. I've got to put it into practice. In other words, is there a plan in my life to succeed in my Christian walk? Have I set up guards? Have I, have I um, made that I'm going to be in the word and, and I'm going to cultivate prayer and I'm going to have fellowship with others and I'm going to walk in victory. I'm going to put on the armor. I'm going to face the attacks. I, I'm going to stand in these. Is there a plan? There's an offensive plan and a defensive plan. If you don't want to fall into sin, you need a plan. Think about that. Though you will sin because you're in the flesh, God has given you everything to not sin. It's the choice you make. Oh, it just overtook me. Yeah, that can happen. But what's your plan? What's your escape route? It's Jesus. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, flee youthful lusts. That's a plan. And pursue righteousness, faith, and love with those who will call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's a plan. So sometimes people have defeated lives because they have failed to plan. They have failed to put into action the things that they read in the Word. The third thing is their focus. They're focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing so much on how can I not sin that they've forgotten and they've removed their focus from how great Jesus is. I will tell you this. The more you focus on who Jesus is, with all your attention and all your affections, the smaller and less powerful the sin has in your life. But the moment you start focusing your whole Christian life on it's all about what I don't do, that I'm not going to fall into this sin, you've already set yourself up for failure. Because Jesus is the focus. And Jesus is our victory. And the more I'm focused on him, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to enjoy the life that he intended and not be so fixated on the sins. I'm going to look at Hebrews and say, lay aside every sin and the weight that so easily besets you. There you go, Jesus. Let's go forward with you. It's not the focus. But when my focus is on sin instead of the Savior, and I'm failing to walk in a right plan that God has laid out, and I'm forgetting what he has done for me, then there's unbelief, and there's self-reliance, and there's a misery of the Christian walk that takes place. You don't have to sin. 
you're no longer a slave to sin. You've changed owners. And Christ is your master. So what do you do from here on out? You stop letting sin have its way. Look at verse 8. He says there, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Fact number three is I'm done with death's grip. Jesus came and knocked him down, knocked him out, and took his belt, and there's a new champion in town. And we say, listen, because he won, I can win. It's really that simple. You know, we're in this NBA uh, playoff, those of you guys that are into that NBA playoffs, and there's going to be a champion. And uh, it's often the case that Jesus is the one who is the champion. We're just simply on the team. I'm sitting the bench. He's making the shots. I'm just glad I got a jersey on, you know? That's about it. He does the plays, makes the shots. He's the star of the show. He took the whole team on his shoulders. And then he says, hey, why don't you join with me in this celebration? We won the championship. It's like David versus Goliath. You realize that I'm not David. You're not David. Jesus is the David. We're the children of Israel shrinking back in fear, going, check out that giant, man. He's too big. And our Jesus steps up and goes, you know what? I'll take him down. I'll take the stone, the tomb, and I'll throw it at his head, and he's going down, and I'll cut off his head. And we simply run and go, yeah, we won. What did you do? <laughs> he did the work. But it's so glorious to be on his team that to go, you know what, he won, and so I win too. I simply just walk in the victory of it. It's a beautiful thing. So know the facts. Know what it means to be saved. Number two, you're going to add it up. You're going to reckon yourselves. That's what I reckon. Verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Reckon where you stand. Reckon these things to be true. Add it up. You know, the hillbillies did have it, right? And they said, I reckon. But it wasn't like I suppose or I maybe. It was added up. It, it's like an accounting term where you're balancing the books, where you're looking at the, the things and, and everything comes together. And now you say, wow, it makes sense. It's plain. It's clear. This is what it is now. And the reality of it sinks in. That we are dead to sin and alive to God. Positionally, I have changed from death to life, from a friend to a foe, or I'm sorry, from a foe to friend, from the sinner to the saint. And I want you to know that God is not just pleased to have you in the family, He wants you to thrive in the life of the family. He's got it all for you, you just have to simply say, Lord, that's what I want. So I know the facts. I reckon where I stand. Number three, you know, such an important thing, is to present yourself for his use. Look at verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Present yourself once and for all to say, Lord, here I am, I'm yours. I am your vessel, I am your instrument, your weapon, your tool is what it really means for whatever you have in store, Lord. I'm no longer presenting myself to sin to do whatever it wants. I am presenting myself to you, Lord, to do what you want. I am God's valued vessel. Because you find that God takes what sin has destroyed and he makes it into something beautiful. There's a, there's a, you can look it up on YouTube. There's an orchestra called the Landfill Orchestra. They took the, from the, the Keturah slums of Paraguay, they took these trash items and they began to fashion and form them together and made these beautiful instruments and they travel around the world playing these garbage cans and such uh, instruments. Or you can go to Tennessee and in the Appalachian Museum there, I found years and years ago, the ukulele. It was great. It was a toilet seat turned into a guitar. And I thought, I want to play that someday. They make cigar box guitars. They make them out of oil cans. We're going to have a ukulele class starting next week and how to make your own guitar out of your toilet seat at home. <laughs> but God can take things that have trashed you and he can turn them around as a testimony. Look at the beauty that God can bring to the life that simply says, Lord, I am, I am yours. 
play through me to your glory, God. I am God's vessel. Verse 14, he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not, he says in verse 15. Death doesn't rule. Sin doesn't rule either. In verse 1, he's talking about habitual sin that doesn't need to reign in your life. In verse 15, he's talking about the occasional sin, that I don't make excuses even for the occasional sin. I'm not going to beat myself up with the occasional sin, but I don't want to excuse it away to say that's no big deal. I want to confess it to the Lord, turn from it, and keep going forward in my relationship with God. I have a new purpose. Verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? My purpose is to serve the Lord. You realize this, as people say, oh, I'm captain of my own ship, no one is a captain, everyone is crew. You are either going to serve sin or you're going to serve the Lord. Everybody's got to serve somebody, as Bob Dylan said. And in a sense, that's like if I could illustrate it by two, by two ships. One is the SS Sinner and the other is the SS Savior. And the SS Sinner is, is a blast. It's got a lot of fun. There's a lot of people on it. And yet they don't realize this, that there's no lifeboats, there's no life vests there. But it sure is a lot of fun. And the other thing they don't realize is at the bottom of the ship, well, there's a hole in it. It's been duct taped and bubble gummed, but that's okay because we're still having fun. And as it goes across the waters, it hits the frigid waters of the Atlantic and things begin to shrink and people still say, well, you know what? I got time. I can get off this boat at any point. I'm just having a good time and so I'll wait until my final last days and then I'll jump ship and get on the Savior ship. What they don't realize is the boat goes down in the middle of the night sometimes. The bubble gum and duct tape doesn't hold. And you can choose to ignore it and say, but we're just having a good time. Or you can say, you know what, I'm jumping ship because the Savior ship is right there. A little smaller, but it's safe. And it's secure. And he has everything I need and all the supplies I need for life right there. And he'll catch me. I guarantee you, he'll catch you when you jump ship from one to the other to say, I want to be on the Savior ship. I want to be a part of his crew. And it's better than the love boat. I'll tell you that. It's going all kinds of places in the glory of God for you to experience. But you have to make that choice. You have a purpose for the glory of God in your life. The fourth thing, the last thing we see is that we need to not only know the facts, we need to reckon where we stand, we need to present ourselves for his use, and number four, we need to obey from the heart. Look at verse 17 and 18. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You jumped ship. You allowed the gospel to mold you. That's what that form means. It's a molding, that doctrine of the gospel. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. See, God didn't set you free to say, hey, have a nice day. Call me when you get in trouble. He set you free to use you, for you to be the vessel, for you to have purpose, for you to find the glory of God worked out in your life. And he says very clearly in verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. You see, it's along the way I have this new goal of holiness in my life and unto the Lord. I want to see the fruit of holiness in my life and expressed on that final day. He says in verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The fruit of sin is shame and death. There's nothing to glory in. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a great verse. If you haven't memorized 623, that is key right there. My sin deserves death. God's grace brought me life. God has a goal for you. I want to share with this, this with you in 1 Peter chapter 1. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind 
Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Lord, I want to be holy inward in my person. I want to be holy outward in a witness. And I want to be holy upward in my worship of you. So at Christian, it's so important. This chapter is, sets the tone. How am I going to live this Christian walk? Know the facts of what Christ has done for you. Reckon where you stand and live in the reality. I am dead to sin and alive to God. Present yourself to say, Lord, I am yours now. Your servant, in a sense, your bond slave to use me for your glory and obey from the heart what God is leading in your life.